Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas, um, the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm just going to throw out another 4 a.m. mind-wandering thinking while I was feeding my baby. <laughs> it's when my brain does certain things. And, and here's just a, a really a technical thought. The first thing uh, that I thought about is where does damage happen and how do we measure it? Where does damage happen and how do we measure it? Well, <clears throat> the standard way in which we measure things, certainly when it comes to uh, carbohydrates and lipids, and all, we check the blood. We either do a finger stick or we check the blood or we wear a CGM. Uh, and the CGM sits in our interstitial fluid. Uh, the stick in our finger checks capillary blood. And otherwise, we're checking venous blood. Well, obviously, the human body is a very complex thing. And we know categorically that chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption causes harm. We know that absolutely. There's a lot of argument about what else goes into that harm, but that is absolutely true. And there may or may not be an effect by lipids, LDLs, triglycerides, cholesterols, uh, all of the fat markers, polyunsaturated fatty acids, or whatever it is. But, and, and the same argument holds true for nicotine consumption, whether that's through smoking or vaping or anything else. So let's follow this through and understand my logic when it comes to measurement. Because the damage from either sugar or nicotine can happen in two places. Number one, it happens intravascularly inside of the blood vessel. And secondly, as the human system tries to protect that high concentration of nicotine and sugar in the blood vessels from damaging the blood vessels, the human body distributes that nicotine and sugar into the cells. So when we measure normal tables and everything else, how do we do that and how does that correlate uh, with what we're doing? Well, the single best measure, the single best measure is to measure what goes in. You can measure exactly how much nicotine goes in when you vape. You can measure exactly how much carbohydrate goes in your face when you eat or drink. Now, there's a little conundrum there with the carbohydrates because you can't quite measure what enters your bloodstream. That's the next step down. So what goes in your face, what goes into your bloodstream. But certainly if it's simple sugars or starches, almost all of that is bioabsorbed. When it's vegetables, a lot of that isn't absorbed because the human body can't absorb that. The nicotine is directly absorbed. And I'm saying nicotine, not smoking, okay? Both of those enter the bloodstream, but they enter the body in separate ways. Nicotine enters the lungs and goes directly into the pulmonary veins and straight to the heart, straight to the beginning of the arterial system. Well, sugar primarily goes from the intestine through the portal venous system, through a short portal vein, it's probably about this long, straight to the liver. And almost all of that gets processed, runs through the liver's capillary system. So the liver has a major effect on whatever we eat from a nutritional perspective except maybe for saturated long-chain fatty acids that go directly into the left subclavian vein through the thoracic duct. But almost all of our other nutrition, harmful or helpful, goes through the portal venous system, and we are not able to measure portal venous blood very easily. I've done that in the lab, folks. I've done it in rats. I've done it in pigs. I've done it in mice. In the laboratory, we put a little catheter in and measured it. However, that's the highest concentration. Then everything goes through the liver, and the liver repackages and reassigns that stuff. And then the liver dumps what it thinks the body needs, or sending it out to other storage spaces, its products, its byproducts, into the inferior vena cava, which is a short, short little blood vessel that runs between the liver and the heart. Then it goes through the lungs, and then it enters the vascular system. Again, nothing easily accessible to measure. Now, both nicotine and the metabolites from the liver 
are in the heart, and the place that you see the next highest concentration of those metabolites, of that nicotine, of that fat and carbohydrate and protein, is in the coronary vessels. Because the coronary vessels, the coronary arteries, are the very first arteries. They take oxygen and food to the lung. Uh, not to the lung, sorry, to the heart. So coronary vascular disease is very common if there is damage in high concentration at that level. Then all those metabolites go down the big vessels, the aorta, the coronary arteries, straight to the brain, or to the rest of the body via the um, arterial system. Via the arterial system. So the highest concentration is in the arteries. And that's why we see damage from nicotine in the arteries, in the carotids, in the arch of the aorta, and in the abdominal aorta, as well as the coronary vessels. Same thing from chronically elevated sugar levels. But we don't quite see that as much in the large vessels. Then the blood flows down. We haven't measured it yet. Haven't measured it. Then the blood flows down to the organs. And in the organs, it flows through a capillary network. Very fine, fine, fine blood vessels, often only one cell thick, which is the endothelial cell. And then the blood's here, the endothelial cell's here, and then the cells that need those nutrients that are exposed to those metabolites are right next to that. Little basement membrane over here, usually most organs, so that you've got this interface, this exchange, very rapidly between the blood vascular space and the cells, and there is a little bit of fluid called the interstitial space, which is around those cells. And the very first measurement that we can take is actually that interstitial fluid. That's the first thing we measure. We can measure that concentration. And at least it gives us a reflection of where we are, and that's a CGM. And it is ludicrous, folks, ludicrous that CGMs are not universally available. That I've got to go through pulling my own teeth out, pulling my hair out, trying to convince insurance companies that my patients, especially my diabetic patients, need CGMs. It is absolutely bloody well ridiculous, and it pisses me off that this wonderful life-saving device is not freely available like a Fitbit. Perhaps if Apple or uh, Google sold these things, instead of these massive for-profit companies, we'd have better access to monitoring our healthcare. Hey, Google, are you listening? Anyway, those are CGMs. But of course, the FDA regulates them. <sighs> okay. Now, those metabolites throw through, flow through the capillary system in the upper part being taken out and in the lower part being dumped in. Then it throw, flows through a series of veins. So, when you stick a needle in your finger to check your blood sugar or your ketones, you're measuring a mixture of capillary and um, interstitial fluid as a mixture of what your blood glucose and your ketones are. But already some of that's been taken out. Then they go into the venous system, and if you're having your blood drawn through your veins, you're not measuring what the cells are seeing. You're measuring what the cells have not seen. Think about that. The cells see what comes at them from the arteries and the capillary system. They take what they need. They dump their shit in there. That's what cells do. They, they shit into your blood vessels. <laughs> and then that is what we're measuring when we do our venous systems. When we're measuring LDL, when we're measuring blood sugar, we're not measuring what the cell sees. We're measuring the bits of things that the cells chose not to see. That's the effluent. So there's a massive disparity between what we're measuring in the veins to what the cells are seeing to, to what's entering our system. And I know, I, I know I'm being a little bit of a, a technical nerd here. Doesn't that blow your mind? Because we are so obsessed with our blood numbers, our vascular numbers. But essentially, we're seeing the shit from our cells. Because when we're looking at LDL and we're looking at VLDL and we're looking at HDL, we're looking at triglycerides from our veins, they've already been to the fat cells. 
we're not measuring what's going from the liver to the cells. We're measuring what's coming from the cells back to the liver. Back to the organs that produce them. Think about flow, folks. Think about flux. So when we measure those LDLs, when we measure those VLDLs, we're measuring what's already come from our fat cells coming back. How can we make reasonable assumptions, reasonable thought processes, reasonable biological thoughts without knowing what the liver is doing by itself? We should be measuring arterial numbers. Now, that'll tell us what the fat cells are doing to those elements. And here's, why is this important? Because I was writing a, a, a book chapter and one of the things that I looked at is I was trying to figure out how do fat cells under starvation conditions, in what form do fat cells release fat back to the body? Because when, when you're starving, the, the predominant source of your nutrition, especially when you're fasting and losing weight, the predominant source of that nutrition comes from your fat cells in the form of fatty acids and glycerol. And the question is, is that coming out as triglycerides, which is the way they went in? Is it being broken down to fatty acids and glycerol? Or is it coming out as ketones? Well, we know the fat cells don't produce ketones. We know that we can measure glycerol in the bloodstream and we can measure low levels of some fatty acids. But folks, the reason LDL and VLDL and those other things uh, exist is because fat doesn't float free in the bloodstream. Fat doesn't float free in the bloodstream. It is hydrophobic. It doesn't like water. That's why we have to package them in these cholesterol lipid molecules Okay, called LDL, called VLDL, called HDL, lipoproteins. So the question is, do the fat cells, when that LDL docks or the HDL docks to them, do they, in a fasting condition, dump a bunch of triglycerides that go back to the liver, where the liver converts those to ketones to distribute to the body because we know in healthy fasting conditions your ketones are elevated you are you you have a little bit a little bit but not enough for nutrition a little bit of an elevation in long chain fatty acids that are uh, uh, attached to uh, albumin for transport we know you you have some triglycerides but usually low triglycerides but you know in researching the literature i could not find any scientific evidence of people looking at what comes out of a fat cell and how is that fat packaged. We know it goes to the cells directly. We know it mostly goes to the liver. We know the liver is the quarterback of metabolism and that the liver takes that fatty acid and converts it to ketones for the body. That's why our ketone levels are up in fasting. And we know that the liver uses glycerol and through gluconeogenesis turns it to sugar. But the liver doesn't store those things. A health, the only place the healthy human body stores fat is in fat cells. Nobody's ever looked at that, and then I thought, why? Well, it's because we measure venous numbers. And I wonder, I don't have evidence, I wonder if there's a discrepancy between arteri arterial values and venous values. And I'd like to know, because I couldn't find any evidence, and I'd like someone to educate me. Does LDL, does HDL transport fat from fat cells back to the liver and to the tissues under fasting conditions? That would revolutionize our thinking. Because if you're taking a statin that suppresses that and you're trying to get healthy and you're going uh, uh, fasting for long periods of time, how the hell are you going to transport that fat? And we know that healthy LDL, LDLA, is full of triglycerides, the big fluffy thing. Well, well, we know that LDL A goes up in fasting conditions in healthy, fat-adapted people whose triglycerides are low, ketones are up, their glucose is low. That doesn't come from the liver, folks, because the liver is empty of fat. 
it has to come from the fat cells. And yet I don't have scientific evidence of that. So I know I'm geeking out over here. Please help me, somebody. But we really have to understand the complexity of human biology. When we measure Venus numbers, we've got to understand how those numbers happened. And can you only imagine what's happening on the arterial side? That's where the really bad things are happening. And maybe that'll advance our understanding of cardiovascular disease, of some of the damage we're doing to our bodies. If I've made you think, folks, I've done my job. But how we measure what we measure and how we understand it is so important. Maybe you had that thought, maybe you haven't. Try feeding a baby at 4 a.m. Take care. I'll see you on my YouTube channel. I'll see you on Instagram. I'll see you on Facebook. Please throw comments my way. I may or may not get to them because I'm still a practicing clinician, but I'll try to.